Today's passage, by God's grace, finds Jacob's sons dining at the table of Joseph, the long-lost brother, who has come to them in the disguise of, of the Egyptian viceroy, Zaphath Paneah. You remember last time, uh, when they left Egypt, these brothers had encountered Zaphath Paneah, and, 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 and he was in charge of distributing grain, and, and he had treated them harshly upon first encountering them. Joseph recognized his brothers, and they didn't recognize him, and he treated them like they were spies and, and, and sent them away. And so they went away reeling. When they got out of his presence, they, the last place they ever wanted to go was back to see Zaphath Paneah again. But they realized that they had to go back because the famine was was, was continued and, and, and it was so bad that they had to go back and to purchase food from Egypt. And they had every reason to think that when they went back before Zephoth Paneah, when they went back to Egypt, that things would continue to go south. However, Jacob, their father, the great patriarch, had lifted up his hands and blessed them before they left with a covenant blessing in the name of El Shaddai, God Almighty. And, and Jacob had asked the Lord to grant them mercy before the man. And so when they return to Egypt, Jacob's sons finds God's covenant blessing at work in ways that they could have scarcely imagined. When they arrive, they are singled out among the people buying bread, buying grain, and escorted to Zaphath Paneah's private home as his personal guests with an invitation to dine at his own personal home table. And, and this would have been amazing. This would have been shocking. I don't want you to just read over this uh, and take it for granted because this would, have been like, this would have been like showing up to the front gate of Buckingham Palace in London on, on a double-decker red tour bus and, 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 and suddenly being stopped and, and, and escorted off the bus into a black limousine and taken two miles west to Kensington Palace, past the gates, and back to Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's private quarters. <laughs> Amen, somebody. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? That would be really something. That would, that would really be something. I mean, you talk about the selfies that would be taken. <laughs> if, if they took you back to Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's private table, and, 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 and gave you a change of clothes with the promise that, that, that you will be dining with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex at noon. If that happened, beloved, most of us would be, would be thrilled in our souls. We would, we would be shocked. We would, we would perhaps be, we would be humbled and, and, and perhaps we'd be a little bit frightened at this invitation. When all this happens we probably would feel like something must be uh, amiss, something must be afoot, because this all seems too good to be true. And that's exactly how Joseph's brothers felt. They were escorted back to his private home, his palatial estate, and, and, and told that they would be eating a meal with the second in command of all of Egypt at noon. They were shocked, they were thrilled, but perhaps they were frightened, thinking that this is too good to be true. But the servant assures them that the invitation is real that the invitation is genuine, that their invitation to commune with the royalty is real and genuine. And, and beloved, today we have a similar invitation to dine with royalty. I don't know how you feel about coming to the Lord's table, but, 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 but we will be dining with royalty today, beloved. In, in many ways, uh, escorted, uh, escorted away from the general mundane things of this world, off the tour bus, as it were, back to King Jesus' private table in his house, among his people. And, 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 and this, this invitation is, is, is much, much more important and much more glorious than dining with the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. Or, or, or come on, somebody, or, or even dining with Joseph, the viceroy of Egypt, if we understood the true privilege that we are enjoying today, it would thrill us to our souls. It would be, it would be amazing. It would be thrilling. It would, it would be anything but boring. We'd be so excited because we are dining with the King of kings and Lord of lords. We have an invitation to commune with the greater Joseph, 
Jesus Christ himself in his private house, at his personal table. And I want to lift up some important realities from this text that reveal some, uh, some, 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 some perspective on, on the privilege of dining at the greater Joseph's table. And so I want to I want to I want to talk about three uh, this week three realities that we that that we see from this text that tells us about the 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 privilege of dining at Joseph's table, and I, and I hope beloved that that as we walk through this you are getting you will get a fresh perspective of the blessing of being able to come into the Lord's house and dine at His table. I hope you will get a renewed sense of of exactly what it actually means to be in his house and at his table. First of all, we see, if you're taking notes, write this down for point number one. We see a partial fulfillment that anticipates a greater reunion. A partial fulfillment that anticipates a greater reunion. We are given hope, hope at the Lord's table. Anticipatory hope at the Lord's table table. Look at verse 26. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present that they, had, that they had with them, and they bowed down to him to the ground. And he inquired about their welfare and said, is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? This is interesting. This is an interesting comment, and it's not a throwaway comment, and it's not a comment that is, comes to us out of mere curiosity on Joseph's behalf. See, the last time Jacob's sons were in Egypt, remember, there were only 10 of Jacob's brothers in Egypt to buy grain. And, 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 and when, he, when they bowed down to him the first time, Joseph remembered his dreams. And remember, in the first dream, uh, the, uh, his brother's sheaves uh, of wheat bowed down before his sheaf of wheat, right? And, and, but, 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 but in that first dream, listen, listen, uh, in that first time, there were only 10 brothers that bowed down. But remember, Joseph had two dreams. And in his second dream, he said, behold, 11 stars bowed before me, and the sun and the moon, which stood for his parents. And so although 10 brothers bowed down before Joseph the first time, it was only when they came to his table the second time and bowed down that he saw all 11 of his brothers bowing down before him. And he knew that God's promise was still coming to pass. And although they presented a present before him, uh, Joseph, Zephath, Phinehas does not even talk about the present. What does he talk about? He said, what about my father? Because he knows in his dream, it was not only 11 stars, but also the sun and the moon. And so when, when he saw his 11 brothers bow down before him, he knew that God's saving promise was going to come to pass. And he knows that this mini family reunion around the table, it, it looks forward to the great family reunion when all of God's people will be gathered around the table. He asked about Jacob because he's looking forward to the full fulfillment of God's promises, of God's infallible, incontrovertible, indomitable, unassailable, saving promises that were still coming to pass. He knew when this first reunion happened that the full reunion was sure to come. And beloved, every time we gather around the Lord's table, we get that very same confirmation when we come and we see a people gathered from every tribe and nation and tongue uh, around the Lord's table on the Lord's day, we get tangible proof that God's saving promises to sanctify us, to redeem us, to rescue us are being fulfilled just as he said they would. Remember our Lord Jesus, the greater Joseph declared in Luke 13, 29, people will come from the east and west, from the north and south, and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And here we are 2,000 years later on the other side of the world in West Michigan, a people that, that the ancient uh, Hebrews could not even imagine or could not even thought of being gathered from every tribe and nation and tongue in the kingdom of God. We are here bowing before the reign of the greater Joseph. And, and listen with his brothers 
looks at all of his people anticipating the day when all of God's children will be gathered around his table. When Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and his brothers, when King David and all the prophets and, 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 and Joseph and, and, and Mary and, 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 and oh man, my daddy and my grandmama and, and all aunts and uncles and folks that have gone to be with the Lord, one day we will all gather around the Lord's table. And I'm so excited that the, that, 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 that the person that will be on full display is not just, not just grandmama and granddaddy, but the Lord himself will be there fully unveiled in his glory for the glory and the glory of his kingdom will be fully seen. And so when you come to the table, you ought to be given hope. You ought to be encouraged God's promises are still being fulfilled despite the, 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 despite the lies of the devil, despite the plots of the enemy, despite the ways in which the world seems to give us discouragement. God's promises are still being fulfilled and we have tangible proof right here in front of us. Baptist pastor and theologian, the late Vernon Grounds, tells the story of a group of seminarians who often played basketball in a nearby public school. And they noticed that the janitor of the school, an elderly man, would often sit near in the bleachers reading a tattered old Bible. One day they approached him and they were shocked to see that he was reading from the book of Revelation. These seminarians had taken intro to New Testament courses and, and all kinds of Greek and and in all these languages, and, 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 and they couldn't make heads or tails out of the book of Revelation. And so they look at this old janitor and they say, Sir, do you understand what you're reading? Do you even know what this book means? The old man looked up at the seminarians. He said, Of course I do. It means Jesus is going to win. Yeah. Lord have mercy. Jesus is going to win, and, and that's the best commentary on the book of Revelation, and it's the best commentary on this 66 books of the Bible, and that's the best commentary on the Lord's Supper that you're ever going to get. When you come here and you see the bread being broken, when you see the cup going forth, you know for certain that no matter what comes into your life, Jesus is going to win. No matter how hard life has been, Despite troubles, sorrow, and sickness, and discouragements, when we see God's people gather around the table, we know, we know Jesus is going to win. It's because God's promised to gather us and commune with us and sanctify us and come get us. Still being fulfilled. Thank God. Ain't that good news, sister? Ain't that good news? That good news. I mean, hey, if you, if you, if you ain't looking forward to today when, when Jesus comes back, you ain't been through nothing. But if you've ever been through some stuff, if you've ever been through some hard times, if you've you ever been grateful that this is not your home, oh, Lord, you are grateful to come to this table and to see Jesus is going to win. Jesus is coming back to get us. Jesus is not going to leave us down here. But, but we have this table as anticipating the great table that is being erected in glory. Jesus comes back to receive his people. Jesus is going to win. That brings us to point number two. Secondly, we have at this table an unexpected revelation of the Savior's love. An unexpected revelation of the Savior's love. Listen, we are loved as family at the Lord's table. Verse 29 says, And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, is, is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. It says, then Joseph hurried out for his compassion grew warm for his brother. And he sought a place to weep. The Hebrew uh, uh, gives you the sense that, that Joseph, it literally says, Joseph's, Joseph's, Joseph's bowels got hot. Lord have mercy. Joseph's heart got hot. His, his heart, he, he, could, he could not contain the emotions that, that, that he had uh, for his family. Uh, they, they, there was his brother, his, and I want you to notice, I want you to notice the family language. Now, now, now keep in mind that Joseph's brothers had come to the table with gifts, and they thought that they would get acceptance and favor from Zephath Paneah based on their gifts. 
They heard that they were going to eat bread with him. They heard he was coming back at noon. And so, ha, ha, we've got some gifts for him. And the reason he's going to love us and the reason he's going to accept us and the reason he's going to be okay with us is because we got some pistachio nuts and, and we got some of this and we got some of that. And we're going to give it all to him and he's going to feel good about what we gave to him and then he'll accept us. You see. But when they present all these gifts to Joseph, it's almost like he doesn't even pay attention to these gifts. He doesn't say a single thing about them. Joseph's heart was bursting with love and favor, not based upon their gifts, but based upon their relationship. Notice the familiar language again. When he lifted up his eyes, he saw his brother, Benjamin, his mother's own son. And listen, when we come to the Lord's table, we are oftentimes thinking about the quality of the gifts that we bring to him. And we think that we will be welcomed based on the quality of the gifts that we bring to him. We, 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 if we had a good week, a faithful week, and, and if we read our Bible like we were supposed to and we prayed like we were supposed to, then we feel real good at the Lord's table. We feel like I've got a great hearty welcome at the Lord's table because I've been so good to the Lord. But when Jesus sees us, he sees, listen, 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 he sees us as his family. And the reason he welcomes us is not because of the gifts that we bring to him, but because of the gift that he's already brought to us. Oh, Lord have mercy. He sees us, and he looks at us, and he sees his own father's children. Lord have mercy. He sees bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh sitting right here at this table. And listen, if you think that Joseph's heart burned hot for his brothers, the Lord Jesus Christ, when we come to his table, his compassion wells up for you, and it wells up for me, not because we've been so good, not because we've been so faithful, but because we have been adopted in the beloved, because we have been saved by His Spirit and sanctified by His Spirit and sealed by His Spirit, and we've been called His people. We are His children. We are His brothers and sisters, and we are not here merely because we are forgiven. We are here because we are adopted and beloved. Yes. Yes. J.I. Packer, in his monumental book, Knowing God, said it well. He taught on adoption. He says that adoption in Christ is the highest privilege that the gospel offers, higher even than justification. He says, it is one thing for God the Father to forgive sinners, but it is entirely another for Him to adopt them into His family. He says, yet that is what the Bible teaches. We are not merely forgiven. We are graciously invited into God's family as his children, co-heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 2, 11 through 12, says both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He declares, I will declare your name to my brother. Brothers and sisters, in the assembly, I will sing your praises. And here the Lord has brought you, a rebel and a sinner, someone who had been in their darkness apart from God and apart and alienated from his promises. And he has brought you into the beloved. He's made you one of his children. He set you around his table, and he loves you. Despite you having a bad week, despite you having bad tendencies, despite you having bad thoughts, he still saved you. And he says, I will love you, and my love will never change. I will declare your name. I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. And here, here I am trying to preach the gospel to you, but I always say that Jesus is the real preacher. And even right now, as his word is going forth, this promise of him declaring God's name among his brothers and sisters are still being coming to pass. Ain't that good news today? You are sitting here, you've been washed in his blood, sealed in his spirit, baptized in his name, covered in his righteousness, chosen and adopted into the beloved, and as long as you are in the family, you have a place at the table. <laughs> beloved, your gifts, your lives, your moral rectitude and, and, and religious strivings can never coerce God's love. It is freely given because you are his children. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You can't make God love you. God loves you. 
He loves you. He, do, he does. He, 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 he loves you. He loves you before the foundation of the world. When he looked out into the mass of desperate humanity and he saw you there in your need and in your, and in your lack and in your want, and he chose to love you. My goodness, my goodness, my goodness. You can't coerce God's love. Author Gerald Pinnock tells the story of when he and his family adopted a newborn into their family, and he says it this way. He says, my wife and I waited 15 years for a child that never came by the natural way, biological way. He says, however, we were approached one day with, a, with, a, with an opportunity to adopt a newborn, and he says, I remember standing in front of the judge on the day of adoption, and he pointed his finger at me and he asked, is anyone coercing you to adopt this little boy? He says, after we had assured him that we were doing it out of love for our son, he made this statement, from today on, he is your son. He may disappoint you, even grieve you, but he is your son. Everything you own one day will be his and he will bear your name. And he said, the judge looked at the clerk and gave this command, so order a change in this child's birth certificate, and may it reflect that these are the parents of this child. And ain't that good news on the day in which we were justified, the day in which we were adopted, the day when we were brought into the Lord's family. He, he looked at the divine clerk and he said, so order it. Oh, Lord, have mercy. From this day forth, this person will be my child. And there's nothing that can change it. Oh, Lord, have mercy. And something we might grieve the Lord and we might disappoint the Lord. But one thing is certain. One thing can never change. One thing is irrevocable. If you are in Christ, you you are God's child today, and there's nothing that could ever change that. Ain't that good news? That love can never be coerced. That, that, that love can never be manipulated. That love is a gift that must be freely given, and it's been freely given to God's people. It's not based on merit, but based on this unchanging, eternal relationship that has been purchased by the blood of Christ. Brings me to my last point. We see here at the table the particular knowledge of the Savior King. The particular knowledge of the Savior King. We are not just known generally, but we are known particularly and personally at the Lord's table. Look at what it says in verse 33. This is interesting because the text makes a big deal out of this. It says here, and they set before him, the brothers set before Joseph. They begin, they don't, they don't know. They don't know that Joseph knows them. They think this is Zaphath Panea. He's still in disguise, and, 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 and then something shocking happens. They said, and they said before him, verse 33, the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. The text literally says in the Hebrew, astonishment. They were stunned. They were shocked. They, were, they didn't know what to make of this. And you may be thinking, well, what's going on here? Because listen, listen, Zephath, Panea, Joseph actually had each of his 11 brothers sit exactly according to their birth order. And, and, to, and listen, listen. Uh, uh, in their mind, this is just a, a strange Egyptian viceroy. How in the world does he know what order we were born in? We all got beards. We're all grown men. How does he know who was born first, who was born second, who was born third, who was born fourth, who was born fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh? And he has them all sit exactly according to birth order. And they knew something is afoot. We are known much more at this table than we could have ever imagined. We, 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 we are not just strangers at this table, and we're not just known generally at this table, but we are known particularly each according to birthright. They are so well known that they look at each other in absolute astonishment, and this would have been confirmation to them that all of this was not happening according to happenstance or just a general providence, but according to God's particular tailor-made providence and plan for their life. Beloved, do you remember not so long ago when every ticket at the movies was general admission? Now, come on, somebody. 
I, I remember that. I remember when you, you know, you go with your family and your friends and you get your popcorn, you go in the theater only to find that there's one seat all the way at the top in the back and here you are with your kids or with your family members and then there's one seat all the way at the front when you got to crane your head up at the, at the screen and then there's one seat in the middle. And if you're there with children, they're looking at you real nervous, like, are you going to make me sit next to strangers? Can I sit in your lap? And, and, and in that moment when you realize that you got a general admission ticket, you recognize that general admission don't know me. General admission, general admission don't know my needs. General admission don't know my family. General admission didn't know I needed some popcorn and raisin nets before I came in here. General admission did not care. General admission don't care because general admission don't know us, but I'm so grateful that it ain't no general admission tickets to the Lord's seat or at the Lord's table. Ain't no general admission seating around this communion table. Listen, every seat at the Lord's Supper is reserved seating. Oh, oh Lord. Every seat at the Lord's table has been purchased by the blood of the Lamb. And he looked at you, and he had Joe, he had Joe, listen, listen, he had you in mind and your life in mind. And listen, beloved, he had your name in mind when he, when he shed his precious blood. And listen, he purchased, he didn't just purchase general admission, get in where you fit in. It was row six, uh, seat 11. And you get in there, and, then, and, I, and I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful for a particular seating at the Lord's table. You know... Now when you go to the movies, one of the most exciting things is when that little screen comes up and they say, you pick where you want to go. You say, oh, oh well, yeah, there it is. This one, this one, and this one. We all next to each other. And those little gray seats come up and you're just so excited. You know why? Because, because you realize that your experience will be tailor-made. You realize that you can go get some popcorn and some raisinettes and you still got a seat that's going to be there. You realize that your role will still be waiting on you when you get there. And oh, Lord have mercy. Jesus Christ has purchased a seat that ain't going nowhere. Nobody else can take your place. It's got your name on it. It's been, it's been chosen from an eternity past. It's been purchased in the blood. It's been sealed by the Spirit. It's been brought by the blood. And he listened. And when the gospel went forth, he snatched you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And he's given you a place at his table. And every seat at this table is according to birthright. We come out of an innumerable mass, innumerable mass of desperate humanity, and the Lord looked down before the foundation of the world and chose you to be holy and blameless. Oh, man. He, did, he didn't just choose us. He chose Kelly Bradford to be holy and blameless. He chose Jim DeRisher to be holy and blameless. He chose Sue Ben to be holy and blameless. He chose Tanisha to be holy and blameless. He chose us to be holy and blameless. It wasn't just, listen, he chose you to be holy and blameless. And so when you come to this table, you ought to be excited that this table has a seat with your particular name on it. That somebody is taking care of you, that you don't just have general admission, but Lord have mercy. You got a VIP seat. You, 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 you got a front row seat. You, you got a backstage pass. You, you got a lanyard with the name VIP purchased in the blood of the Lamb. Lord have mercy. When we get baptized, that's like a VIP seat. That's like a VIP lanyard. That's, I've been purchased. I've been bought. I got, I got privileges. I can sit at the table. I can sit at the table. I've been sealed in the Spirit. I can sit at the table. When I come to faith in Christ, I, I, I can sit at the table because, because, not because I'm so good, but because He's so good. And we listen, beloved, and the thing that's so wonderful is not only, not only, not only are we given a particular place at the table, but the Lord knows and cares for us according to our particular unique circumstances. Ain't that good news? You know what it's like to go somewhere and, 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 and someone gives you some clothes and the clothes is a one size fits all. <laughs> but they really wouldn't think about your size when they made it. And there you are trying to put on a medium. You know you don't wear no medium. Or, there you are trying to put on extra large and you're too small for extra large. 
And they just put it just a one size fits all, and, and they wasn't really thinking about you. They really wasn't thinking about you. They were just, just anybody, just come on. But, I, but, but I'm so glad that the Lord was thinking about you. When he, oh man, when he shed his precious blood and, and, and he lived that perfect, that perfect robe of righteousness that he gives to us, ain't just a one size fits all. It's got your name on it. Oh man, it's got your name on it. Listen, it, it, it comes to you according to your exact specifications and needs. And what the scripture says, Psalm 139 says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. Such knowledge, listen, go, he goes on to say, such knowledge is too high for me. What the psalmist is saying, he's saying, Lord, you, you know me better than I could have ever imagined. That's exactly the feeling that Joseph's brothers got at the table. They were astonished. Kid Zephath Paneah knows us better than we could have ever imagined. King Jesus, the greater Joseph, knows you better than you could have ever imagined, knows you're rising up, knows you're laying down, knows a word that comes on your mouth before it ever comes in your mouth. He knows everything about your life. He knows your encouragement. He knows your sorrows. He knows your struggles. He knows your tears. He knows everything about you. And he's got a tailor-made blessing at this table for you that will fit your circumstance and will fit your life and will fit your particular emotional state. Listen, I know, I, I know that I love the Lord because the Lord loves me, not just us, but me. Listen, yeah. Listen, there are tailor-made encouragements and comforts and blessings and healings for our life in our particular situation at this table. You say, well, pastor, you don't understand. You don't understand. I, I, I'm anxious. Well, beloved, there's peace and nourishment for your faith at this table. You say, but, but, but beloved, you say, but pastor, you don't understand. I, I'm depressed. Well, there's hope and there's joy at this table. You say, but I'm struggling with pride. Well, there's humility for you waiting at this table. Well, well, pastor, I got a besetting sin. Well, there's healing for your sin at this table. Well, pastor, I need some hope today. I just, I just need some hope. There's hope for you at this table. Listen, well, pastor, I just, you don't understand. I just, I, I got this particular need, and, and I just don't know where it's coming from, and I'm just a little bit afraid. Well, there's comfort for you at this table. Listen, everything you need is at this table. I love Dr. Washington. Dr. Eric Washington said well on last week. He said, you can't tell it like I can what the Lord has done for me. And I hope, and I wonder if you can testify to that, that, that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't just give general admission grace. Oh, Lord, but the Lord Jesus Christ gave special grace. And amongst the general call, that was a special call that came right to you. And not only did he do that, when you came into faith, he continued to be a special Savior. You say, I came in. I needed some encouragement. Nobody knew what I was going through. But when the Word went forth, somehow the Holy Spirit caused the Word to be tailor-made to my situation. How many times has the Lord spoke straight to you? I've had people tell me time and time again, Pastor, how did you know what I was going through? Pastor, how did you know my, the needs of my heart? Pastor, how did you know what I was struggling with? Pastor, how did you know the doubts of my mind? Well, I didn't know it, but the Lord knew it. Zephaniah knew it. The greater Joseph knew it. And from glory, he looked down at you and he gave his word straight to you. Ain't that good news? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 God is a good God. He's a merciful God. He's a kind God. And He's a specific, particular God. Oh, Lord, have mercy. That is good news today. That gives me confidence. I know that this thing can't go wrong because Jesus has got me in his hand in particular. He knows exactly where I'm at. He knows what he's doing with my life. He knows what he's doing with your life. The Lord hasn't forgotten you. The Lord hasn't been general with you. The Lord doesn't have a divine astigmatism where he just sees all of us like a big blurry mass. No, 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 no. The Lord has got high definition sight. The Lord can see everything about you. The Lord can see all the particulars of your life. And oh, Lord have mercy. He's saying, I got a, I, listen, I got, I got a, and listen, Dr. Jesus has got a specific medication. Lord have mercy. A specific prescription, a specific balm, a specific healing right here at this table for you. 
right here at this table for you. So I'm grateful today of, of the privilege of being able to go to King Jesus' house one more time and sit around his table one more time and receive grace and healing from his hand one more time. Father, we thank you. Lord, we have been encouraged and blessed, O oh Lord, thrilled our souls at the particular grace that, that is held out for us at the greater Joseph's table. Lord, help your people to know, O oh Lord, how much you love them, O oh Lord, how much you have stored up for them, how many tailor-made blessings, O oh Lord, you have purchased for them, O oh Lord, and have placed for them right here at this table. Help them, O oh God, to be encouraged, to be strengthened, and to rejoice, O oh Lord, in all your goodness to them. Help them to know, Lord, that there's no greater table they could be at on today than at your table, O oh Father. Strengthen them, encourage them, give them everything they need. In Jesus' name we pray. All of God's people say it. Amen.